Hello, everybody. Can you hear me and see me all? I never guess that would be true. Um, let me know if you cannot hear me or see me, but otherwise I'll get started. It's great to have a handful of you here with us so far. I bet that'll grow. Um, I think I'll just get right into things. And well, first of all, I'll say thank you so much for all the interest in the last couple live sessions. It's been really great to have you. Um, and this evening, the focus that I'd like to offer up would be around specifically our cattle panel high tunnels and any questions that folks have with them, but then basically any of the season extension experiments we're working with. So if you're interested in knowing more about our uh, greenhouse attached to our home or cold frame ideas, or if you've got suggestions and things like that, very much open to it. So that all said, um, if you have some questions and you want to put them forward, now is a great time. If you can think to put your questions in all caps, that would be ideal. It'll help me see them a little bit more clearly, but I'll keep my eyes out on this thread as we go. It's nice to see you all here. Seeing and hearing fine, folks say. Maybe there's a little delay, hopefully not too, too much of one. Um, so let me know what you got. I see 32 folks on here. Does anyone have a question? Because if not, I can start sharing some ideas. Maybe I'll, um, let's see. I see Rosen Duger. Can we get a quick rundown of dimensions, price, and sourcing cattle panels? Great, straightforward question. Yes. Cattle panels that we work with, we happen to get them from Tractor Supply. Not recommending that place necessarily, but we have uh, we have one nearby. They work for us. Um, they are 16 feet long, and they are 50 inches tall, and they are about $23 a piece, $25 a piece. But you might want to look for a local um, agricultural supply place first or a fencing company first. But what we go for are uh, specifically called cattle panels from Tractor Supply. So thank you for that question. Um, First time anyone has been told, yeah, all caps on the internet. Normally not a great uh, request, but in this case, it's helpful. Um, Middleway, oh my gosh, thank you for 20 bucks. That is a wonderful thing. I, I appreciate that very much. Um, create synergistic transformations, plant selection for the greenhouse at some point. If you could elaborate on what you're asking there, that would be great. Um, and James, nice to see you. Um, yeah, ask that one again. Maybe you've got some specific uh, specific question you're going for. Um, Fallen Angel, can we do a bigger greenhouse with more cattle panels? Really good question. I think I would offer a tentative yes or a maybe. We had some friends. Uh, so the panels we work with, you know, set up in the arch, we generally have used four of them in a row, which give us about a 16 foot long panel seven and a half feet wide um, is our the high tunnels we make if you were to make one five or six or seven you know longer than that you i would strongly encourage you considering some sort of framing where maybe your permanent raised beds have a wooden arch or a central wooden beam that runs through them to unify them we had some friends that made a six panel uh cattle panel high tunnel and it collapsed in the middle I'm not sure if it was the dimensions, but I think the longer they go, the further. They go. So yes, but be careful. That said, I just had a tough connection there for a second. So hopefully, uh, let me know if you're seeing any um, any issues here. Uh, Sandy, 3127, how do you transport them? And I'm assuming what you're asking is specifically the cattle panels. Um, there's some really good videos. I would, I would encourage you to look on YouTube about moving cattle panels in the back of a pickup truck. You can take the panels and lay them into an arch. What's the way to describe this? So imagine with my hand, the front of my hand is the front of a truck and you've got the bed in the back. I make the arches in the back. That was not a really good way to do it. Basically you, you put them in, in a bend 
with the tip of the bend facing the front of the truck. And you can put up to like eight of them in the back of a truck that way. But check out some videos online. You'll find them very easily. Uh, that's worked very well for us. Um, pardon me while I zoom back through here. Um, okay, I think I'm getting caught up here. Yeah, folks are offering the different prices. It looks like in Canada, it's more expensive. And down the States, it's around $20 or so. I'm not going to say that cattle panels are far and away the best, the only way to build at all. It's just they've worked really nicely for us. So maybe where you live, you've got better solutions that you can work with. Um, Paul Conrad's asking, do you use pressure treated wood for the base? Uh, I do not. In our case, we have access to a black locust lumber mill and they sell off cuts of their lumber at a very low price. So we use that. You may find, uh, you might have a local mill if you can find black locust or larch or white oak, you might find off cuts that work really nicely for you. Uh, and that might be a way to go. Let's see. Back to basics homemaker. What about using pallets to create more height? It's an interesting question, and a number of folks have suggested this in the past and uh, mentioned it as a way to get more height. I personally am a little leery of adding pallets underneath the structure. I have concerns about how to make it structurally very sound. Um, as it is, being able to have the arch of the cattle panel come up and down and simply hammering in staves of wood that I can wire tie them to has been very practical and very simple. Um, I would also suggest that unless you're much, much taller than let's say six foot three or so, that the arch, the, the natural arch that they make, it accommodates a six foot tall person very comfortably. If you're much taller, you could dig out the central walkway to build the beds on the sides, and that might address that issue. Um, I'm not saying I'm against the idea of that, but I think it's, I think the way they work as they are is simple and elegant and works pretty nicely. Uh, Susan77ism asks, what thickness of plastic is best? Um, what we have used, I'm gonna type this out here so folks have this, Pyrem, A-M, Leo. Um, I just entered into our live chat here a URL for poly remnant sale that AM Leonard offers. What we go for is six mil UV stabilized, which I've typed in as well, just for your reference so you can come back to that. And we go for off cuts of that. So far, we've got four years, maybe five years on some of them without any real fatiguing or ripping. So it, I would not and I very much repeat, would not go to a Home Depot or a Lowe's and just get contractor plastic. It seems like low-hanging fruit seems inexpensive, but I've only heard problems with that. They're, they're not stabilized and they fall apart and you end up uh, picking up tons of flex of plastic that way. Um, okay, middle way. Um, any chance of you implementing options with planting more herbal plants to help keep the little ones healthy and stave off uh, any potential harmful viruses or sickness? Self-care. Yeah, that's a great question. I think as we evolve these systems over time, we're planning on getting more and more perennials inside of these high tunnels. Um, since they're new and since we're still figuring out the layout, the amount of soil, the compost, the building, we're trending more towards keeping them in annuals. And that's a general rule of thumb I like to follow, not a, a solid committed rule, but a basic idea. When I'm not sure how a garden is going to be, I'm not sure how a structure will perform, We, both Sasha and I tend to keep them more in annuals, so they're more malleable and more adjustable. Uh, but we do have plants like Tulsi and uh, some different medicinal plants that grow in those high tunnels. And over time, it'd be nice to incorporate more. Thank you for that question. And thanks again, Middleway, for the, the super chat. You've been very supportive and I really help. I really appreciate the help. Um, let's see. Okay, so Amy is asking, how does a longer cattle panel handle a heavy snow load? Our 20 foot one from a few years ago fell over. I can't address that from direct experience. Um, 
yeah, it seems like the 16 foot ones work really nicely. I think if you're going much, much taller or any wider, really you want the, the geometry to be, I'm using my hands as though they're helpful, but if you're, the base of your panels or the base of your uh, high tunnel is at an angle like this, you're gonna have tons of snow building there if you're in a cold climate like we are. If they're more vertical when they touch the ground, they'll really help shed snow. So our own personal experience has been the 16 foot ones have been ideal so far. Um, let me scroll down here and get caught up again. Boldly grow homestead, any good plastic alternatives? Yeah, I don't know. I think um, if you wanted to make a large high tunnel or any size high tunnel, the plastic seems like so far the best way to go. I can't imagine being able to design them with glass. We did make a video, if you search in our video list under free poly, where we talk about how you can source used but still high quality poly to work with. And that might be something to consider is can absorb a downstream or a waste stream element and give it more life. If you really don't wanna use plastic at all, you might just consider uh, season extension through the idea of microclimates, you know, having compost, heating underneath beds, having large stones that you can paint with charcoal and other explorations like that. Uh, let's see. Okay, getting caught up again here. Middle way, it was my pleasure to answer your question. And yeah, I'm realizing we've got a crazy amount of videos at this point. So hopefully folks find them somewhat useful and interesting. Um, Peter Ellis, thank you. It's not a question, but a good comment that is worth noting. Elliot Coleman has lots of information about other approaches to building these season extension structures. There's so much better information out there than what we have to offer, I'm sure of it. Um, lots and lots of, of people doing great work. So what we're sharing is basically our own experience with a few years of experimenting, but there's some really amazing resources out there for sure. Um, okay, reuse is good, yeah, okay. How often, okay, uh, Georgia, you asked this twice, I appreciate it. How often are you cycling chickens in and out, new chicks and culling older birds of your system? That's a, a bigger question for another time around our chicken operation, but to address that in a straightforward way, we've been basically just accumulating hens for the last many years. People uh, say, oh, they're getting rid of them, they're too old. We've been bringing them on. And then as we want or need meat, we harvest a few at a time uh, for that that time. So for, for one week, we might harvest one or two hens. By the spring, we're hoping to harvest most of our hens out of the system and start new. Uh, and we're gonna be looking for some CAFO uh, chickens to work with and see if we can give them a nice second home. Anyway, um, hello from Ireland. Hello to you from cold New York State. Um, let's see. Ben Capozzi, at what point do you stop adding fresh scraps to the chicken compost winter hoops? Cool, so there's definitely some interest here specifically in the chicken composting operation and how that all works. And um, that's generally a, a continual pipeline in that we add material that's at the beginning of the system on the south end, and as we turn it down through that high tunnel, it breaks down further and further, and then ultimately we take it out from the north end. And you'll have to bear with me uh, in a few minutes or so, I might have to step away. Our cat is doing some things that I might have to address. So bear with me. If I, if I walk away, it's because we've got some cat-related issues to deal with. In fact, Pause for a second. Talk amongst yourselves. I'm on my way back. We'll see if we can get him to stay with me. But Stanley was being a little bit rude. Let's see. <laughs> Greg Carpenter. Uh, can a cattle panel high tunnel be built on a slope? Our garden is on a hill. Good question. I don't have a lot of experience 
it's funny. He's in most of my, my videos at this point. I don't have a lot of experience with really extreme terrain. If there's any possibility to, I would suggest considering laying the high tunnel out on contour with your slope and doing some earthwork in advance of installing the high tunnel where you um, do some earthwork to flatten out. So basically lay it out on contour and flatten it out before you assemble it. And that should be able to absorb more water and give you a stable space. But I think you want a relatively flat space where you assemble something like that. Okay. Built on a slope. Um, doo -doo -doo. Yeah, every cat owner does understand. My cat is doing some things. In fact, I'll tell you what. We're going to pause again for a quick second. He'll go into the greenhouse. <laughs> He's getting into some food that he shouldn't be. Stanley? Gotta love that Stanley. He chooses to do it during a live session. Okay. So this is why these things are free, right? Um, so Amy asks, can you recommend a way of using a cattle panel high tunnel for soil block seedling starts? We trialed soil block uh, approaches a few years ago. I didn't love them. I found that by having the soil, each of the soil pieces indiv or each of the blocks individuated, they dried out very quickly for us and they would get cold very quickly. So I don't have a ton of experience there, but um, you may consider having some sort of uh, unfinished compost underneath them and then either a sheet of poly or a tray to put them on top so they get a little bit of warmth and extra humidity. Uh, but, it, but we tried them, we didn't love them, so we do communal planting for all of our seedlings at this point. Um, ben is asking any ideas for warming the cattle panel hoop house enough to serve as a brooder for baby chicks. I think, so if I remember correctly, brooding chicks, you're looking at somewhere close to 90 to 95 Fahrenheit, very reliably. I don't know that you're gonna get that with a compost heating system in a, a greenhouse or high tunnel, at least in our climate, late winter, early spring. So I think that wouldn't work, but I'm not quite sure. You really wanna make sure you can reliably provide that temperature all day, all night. Um, Okay. Our cats love our greenhouse. Ours do too. They love going in there. Veganism is the way. That sounds like you've got, that wasn't really a question, but thanks for saying what you believe. Um, yeah, on a slope, the planting can be done for gravity water. Really, I mean, this zooms out a little bit from the question before about laying out a high tunnel on a slope. Um, in as a universal, it feels like if you are on a sloped property, anytime you can lay things out on the contour, following the contour of the slope that you're on, that's very, very helpful. Thanks, Fallen Angel, for suggesting that. And if folks are interested, the the super chat thing, if you wanted to kick in a buck or two bucks as a thank you, that's helpful. Um, but I don't feel any pressure at all. Um, in general, the Edible Acres YouTube channel generates us around a living wage for all the work that we put in, which we're fine with, um, but little contributions and things have been very helpful when they come through. James Wall asks, what are your favorite flowers? Jimmy, thank you for that question. That's a wonderful question. We love them all. Um, in general, the ones that seem to be Quite lovely are the perennial flowers. They can wake up. Sasha's got some opinions. Maybe she'll come in and offer up. I'm here with the stuff. She's she's there and she's in the kitchen. Uh, Stanley's in the greenhouse. Just so you know, he went in to start eating some food in there. Um, yeah, I think as a general rule, I I'm a big fan of the umbels, the flowers that make big big heads of tons and tons of little flowers. It seems like those support the widest cast of characters, the little itty bitty flies, the predatory wasps and the like. But boy, all the flowers are pretty wonderful. Oh, um, Jimmy, Jimmy, Sasha will email you her list of favorite flowers. 
Um, and James Randall is saying, love your videos, I'm learning a lot. It's our pleasure to offer them up for sure, for sure. Um, and yeah, like dill, exactly. Any, any of the flowers that present lots and lots of little flowers, little fractals of flowers, pretty helpful for the widest range. Now, did I miss some other questions here? Um, it feels like I'm not getting too, too many questions this time. And if that's the case, we can have a, a shorter session. Um, let's see. So Fallen Angel asks, uh, speaking with, do you have any idea for light for growing seedlings? We don't have money to make a high tunnel right now. Well, I think one thing I might suggest is you don't have to start seedlings under lights. You don't have to start them in a high tunnel. If you're feeling like you've got limited funds, maybe you start your seeds uh, at the beginning of the season. Unless you're trying to get a head start because you're selling plants or you're selling crops, if there's not a pressure to start things early, you can simply sow them at you know at the end of last frost and things like that. Um, if you want to skip lights and high tunnels, any sort of season extension, you can start seedlings in flats in your home and then move them out over time. You may find that you can get some hay bales for free or some piles of wood chips for free and an old glass window or an old glass door from Craigslist or the like for free. And that might give you just enough uh, of a start or a season extension to get things going. I, I suspect you can get an early start on seedling plants without any expenditure. And I hope that that's the case for you. Um, okay. Howdy, Adventure Hawk. Dan, thank you again for those t-shirts. We really appreciate it. Um, so Candide 33, everything is bolting and flowering here right now. Would you dig them up and start new for spring? Wow, you have a very different climate than we do. That's a really, that's a complex question to answer. But when in doubt, if you don't need that bed space explicitly for new plantings, it's nice to let the plants make seeds. You can collect those seeds and sow them elsewhere or just let them simply drop in place. If you need that space, if you've got limited space or limited uh, areas to work in, then yeah, you can pull them, feed them to chickens, compost them, what have you. But we love letting plants make their own seed and saving them. And there's something really sweet, you know, you take a kale or a lettuce that's made a, a, a huge number of seeds, rather than cleaning them all out and winnowing and drying them and labeling them, you can just walk around and just basically crumble them up where you might want more kale or lettuce or spinach elsewhere. And it's it's pretty magical how well that works. Okay, let me get caught up again here. Um, Boldly Grow Homestead, did you get a lot of ice in this storm? Uh, yeah, we got a ton of ice right before a ton of snow. It was a pretty heavy combo, but today it's warmed up a little and seems like we're starting to thaw out a little bit. Um, yeah, Fallen Angel, I mean, if you put a request on your local... Uh, Craigslist for free windows, or if you keep your eye out under materials or free or farm and garden, uh, or maybe there's a reuse store near you, that could be some ways to look into that. Um, Lynx Acres, good question. How tall are your cattle panels, greenhouses on the inside usually? Because we make our arches seven and a half feet wide, roughly, within reason, the from the ground to the peak of the panel is about six foot two inches, six foot four, somewhere in there. And what I've recommended, and I strongly recommend, is if you were to put a cattle panel high tunnel together, to consider committing to the basic design structure of permanent walkway through the very middle, and that gives you the most headspace, permanent beds on either side. And if you have a well drained enough site, you can gain more headspace by taking a shovel and shoveling out your walkway and putting that soil onto your beds. Hopefully that's helpful or makes sense. Um, Eli Johnson, do you ever plan on growing any grains for yourself? Well, uh, I don't think we're gonna be going down the route of perennial grains. I, we're both, both Sasha and I are very interested in 
cooking with and working with um, chestnuts and an upcoming video at some point soon, Sasha makes amazing chestnut polenta, which basically I, I think can replace corn um, as far as our diet goes. And hazelnuts can be pressed for oil and can be used in lots of different ways. So I think as time goes on, we're more interested in exploring perennial tree-based crops to get where we want to go as far as uh, carbohydrates and fat. Um, Luke Greenleaf, uh, general thinking as to the maximum length of a cattle panel high tunnel. Uh, thought most of yours were 16 foot or four foot. Yeah, so this was a question that was posed similarly early on, but uh, it's worth addressing for folks that are just coming in. I have, I have reservations about recommending a cattle panel ton tunnel longer than four panels. Anything longer than there, you definitely want some way of supporting that structure. So please be careful with that uh, or think that through before you commit to something much longer, especially if you've got heavy snow or heavy wind. Sasha, do you think you'd let Stanley back in? <laughs> Stanley's going to be a, a troublesome element, I think, this evening. But what are you going to do? Um, okay. Bear with me and I'll get caught up again. Amy, thank you for the $4.99. We really appreciate it very much. And thank you for being part of this community for such a long time. Appreciate it. Um, let's see. <coughs> Boldly Grow Homestead. Not a question, but growing buckwheat is one of my, f my favorite things. Right now, just for flowers, but the seeds are edible as a grain. Yeah, I'd agree. We've grown buckwheat as a cover crop before, and it's pretty remarkable how straightforward it is. But the challenge, again, that comes with a lot of the annual grains is there's, you know, there's some processing for each of them. You know, we grow, we've tried rice, and then there's a husking and all sorts of things going on there, whereas a lot of the nuts and the tree crops are pretty straightforward. Um, so, I don't know. Um, thank you. Thank you, question mark. All right. Any other questions here? It feels like maybe this is a quieter evening. Um, have you considered guinea hens to incorporate into your compost and nursery operation? Question from Luke Greenleaf. Thank you. Um, I think someday we'd like the idea of guinea hens, guinea fowl, uh, if and when Sasha and I live at the main six acre site we could imagine having them there. Uh, for now, it feels too complex. It already feels complex and dense enough with the number of chickens we have in the system that we have. Um, but we like the idea of them and you know, for the, the tick consumption and all those sorts of good things for sure. Um, so it looks like Amy's corroborating my suspicions about uh, the longer the panels, the, the more you have in line the, the more fragile they can be. So definitely keep that in mind. Um, and Fallen Angel, thanks for suggesting everyone hit the like button. It's free for us and it helps him out. Cool. Um, okay, random question here, but I'll throw it out there because maybe other folks are asking. John Lennigan, what app software do you use to edit your videos? This, is, this channel is probably the least production value channel you're gonna find on YouTube. In some ways, it's an uh, I use an old iPhone that I got um, used online, and I use the default iMovie editing software on the used Mac laptop that we have. Uh, we try to stick with used stuff as much as possible, and I, I'm a big fan of uh, of quantity over quality. <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, cool! Random question. Not about high tunnels and things, but maybe other people are interested. Lynx acres, when planting seeds from walnuts, do you need to remove the husks first? No. Same thing with um, peaches and persimmons and pawpaws and hazelnuts. Trees from seed can definitely be planted in whatever conveyance they come in. So you don't have to do really thorough, crazy cleaning in order for those seeds to be viable. Apricots and peaches, you don't have to crack them open to get the seed out. 
you can go a lot easier than that. So that's that's good news. I love to share good news like that. Um, but yeah, husks on walnuts and the like, you don't have to clean them off. Sean Hagen, wow, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate that. Awesome. Um, Amy's asking, how many chickens can you fit in your 16 foot high tunnel for a winter refuge? Well, we have 60-ish chickens and our 16 foot long high tunnel accommodates that flock, but it's not as though they're all in there all the time. They come and go, um, but you know, 30 or so hens can be in there pretty comfortably throughout the day. I think if we were to have more chickens and more space, a few of those high tunnels would be appropriate. Um, let's see. Let me get caught up here a little while. Um, uh, Argent Vixen, have you ever raised bunnies? We do, we have wild bunnies and they raise themselves. That's great for them. But we have not tried raising bunnies. Maybe someday, but there's just enough wild ones that I think if we wanted them for their manure, we already have their manure spread out nice and evenly through the landscape. And if we wanted them for meat, we could hunt them. But so far, we haven't needed to do that. Um, Linda Kurtz is asking, could you talk briefly about easy tree plant propagation using your property's resources? Um, I'm not sure if I understand that question exactly. Maybe you could throw that question at me with a little bit more of a specific uh, detail. Um, but what I would say to that question is that I've been finding over time growing trees from seed is actually very straightforward. And just to get on a little tangent here, for those of you that are on the fence of, hey, can I, can I start trees or how do I, maybe I want to grow some plants for myself or how do I start doing any sort of nursery work for myself? It's so much more straightforward than you might think. There's parts that are hard, but by and large, I can confidently say that if I can do it, you can do it. I have no formal training in uh, agriculture or anything like that. Um, it, it's really just you start trying to plant them. So if you have, if you've collected hazelnuts or if you collected apples that you thought were interesting, just try mashing them up and putting them in the soil, putting mulch on top and see what happens. You might be surprised how well they actually grow. Um, Fallen Angels asking, have you ever used fresh rabbit? manure. Why can't I use it on carrots? Uh, I haven't tried it explicitly. I think it's one of the more mellow manures from what I understand. And I think in general, when in doubt, if you have a compost or a nutrient ingredient you want to add to a garden and you're not sure about it, do not turn it into the soil. Simply apply it as a top dressing and let it mellow its way into the soil. If you've really got doubts, let it compost for a bit first or apply it on the very far edges of the bed and let it mellow, and then you can move it to the center in the fall. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. James Randall asks, for those of us new to your channel, can you tell us about your education? It's interesting because I just was talking about that a little bit. Um, formal, non-formal, there's probably a few curious out there. Yeah, that'll be fun to go in deeper detail about like what got us here, why do we do what we do, and all that. But I think it is just important to make a shout out to the idea of no formal education, just experimenting and trying for years and years, making tons and tons and tons of failures, of which we've documented some, <laughs> but there are way more out there that we didn't document, um, and figuring it out as we go along. It seems like plant systems, animal systems, do not feel like they want to hide their nature from us. It's just a matter of asking a lot of questions and trying a lot of things. So it's not like a secret world that you have to enter into. It's just a matter of being committed to be part of that world. And it seems to reveal itself over time. It's kind of like a, a hooey answer to a straightforward question. Sorry about that. Um, okay. Lynx Acres asks, Oh, hey, Robbie. Nice to see you on here. 
Um, well, let me get these in order. So Robbie asked this first, and then I'll go to links. How would you set up a cattle panel high tunnel to create soil if you didn't have chickens? Um, I don't know that I would use, I don't think I would set up a cattle panel high tunnel system as a composting system. The only reason we have that one in our chicken yard is because it creates a really nice sheltered warm space for our hens to be active in the winter. If we didn't have any animals in our system, I would still want to set up a high tunnel, but I would use it for season extension and for growth of plants, not as a composting space. I may consider composting on the outside of it, on the west or east side of it, um, but not inside necessarily. And that seems counter to what I'm doing with the experiment of the compost in our high tunnel, but that's gonna be more about getting heat from one little space um, to be able to start seeds in there. Okay, so Lynx is asking, um, Okay, so if I'm growing apple trees from random neighborhood apples, would you market those as rootstock or surprise tree seedlings or what? I would I would just be very straightforward with folks that they are seedling apples. If you're growing them ideally from trees that you think are exciting, that they make a particularly interesting flavor of apple, ideally you're taking photos of those or documenting them somehow and describing to people hey, this is a seedling from a tree that made a really late bearing, super tart fruit that I'm really excited about, but who knows what this one will be. Uh, as long as you're very clear that they're not supposed to expect a honey crisp, but rather this interesting, potentially novel new direction, uh, the right folks would be would gravitate towards that, I think. We were able to sell seedling apples as long as we're clear and forthright about what that means. You should live stream on D Live. I have no idea what that is, but thanks. <laughs> um, okay. Do you sell Jerusalem artichokes? We do. Um, for those that are interested in our plants online, we're sold out for the spring, and I'm really sorry about that. Uh, but we plan to offer tons of plants for the fall. And you can always email us for questions of resources. Let's say you want to do some artichokes or miscanthus grass or this or that, and we don't have it. Shoot us an email and we'll give you a recommendation of some other great nurseries you can source them from. Um, but, um, oh, great question from Wolf Built. Curious about how or if you address airflow in the high tunnel. Is it an issue and what are your thoughts? Thank you for that. Um, it's in the winter, it's a non-issue really. You really want it as buttoned up in our climate, zone 5B central New York, as you can get away with. But um, swing season, you need a little air movement. And in the summer, you absolutely need good air movement. So all of our high tunnels, um, obviously our entrance and exit is going to be on the end. That's also where we're framing out simple wooden doorway and support system there. And the door is a massive vent by default that we can open a little or open all the way. Come midsummer, the door is wide open. And on the far end, we've got windows that are on hinges. I'm using my hands here as though this is helpful to, hopefully this is helpful the way I'm using my hands. Um, but having cross ventilation where you've got windows that are up high that can open outward a little bit, that lets air move all the way through. And on swing season days, the door stays closed. But if we use a univent, and I'm going to type this in, univent lever opener. So you've got a reference there. The univent, it's a wax-based uh, passive opener, or I guess it's, it's just not electric dependent or fossil fuel dependent. That helps it breathe a little bit in the swing season. But all summer, door open, window open. And for our climate, that works just fine. If you're in a much warmer place, then you may have to consider some other approaches. Uh, Amy is asking, do you ever use floating row cover material in your high tunnels to give you a much warmer climate? Um, we haven't used, we, we use, once we start seedlings, we'll put blankets in the high tunnel that on cold nights we'll drop, we'll put in sticks and put them over the seedlings. And I'm going to be documenting in videos soon enough um, there was somebody on Craigslist selling these double insulated polycarbonate panels, 
and I got them pretty inexpensively and I've been making these cold frames that will be our insulated cover inside of a cover. But the basic question, the idea of um, having a cover inside of a high tunnel, it makes a ton of sense, absolutely. Okay. Um, and Mystic, are there any downsides to planting shrubs close to, sorry, things just moved here. Um, I got lost here. Close to a house with a basement, have a sump pump that's very active most of the year. I would be a little careful about, especially elderberry, um, very aggressive rooting shrubs you may not want to have them right next to the base of your home for various reasons. If there's any sort of wiring or tubes or pipes that run right there, um, you may want to go for herbaceous perennial uh, plants that can fill out and be beautiful in the summer and then senesce and be less active in the winter. But elderberry in particular is a massively aggressively rooted plant. Um, all right, Nadia, we're gonna go ahead and remove you from this, thanks. Um, James Randall asks, does your egg production drop in the winter or does the tunnel keep the production the same? Our egg production plummets in the winter. We've got older hens and we're looking at between three to six eggs a day right now in the midwinter and it'll pick up to around 20 or 30 20, 25 in the summer, but it's our older hens are the biggest influencer there. I don't believe that the high tunnel has a huge effect on the overall production of eggs. Um, bear with me for just one second. I want to remove somebody from here. They're unpleasant and unneeded. Um, okay. Uh, James Allen, what kind of plastic cover? For those that are coming in late, um, polyrem.amleo.com. I just typed that in. Uh, six mil UV stabilized seems very important. Uh, Fallen Angel, I'll be growing elderberry from cuttings. Any ideas to help them flourish first time for us? They're really easy. I think you're going to do great. Uh, get them in nice, rich, loose soil as the season gets underway. Every time you get a good, heavy rain, give them a little compost or mulch and they should grow just fine for you. They're they're simple and super rewarding and I encourage all of you to consider this spring trying your hand if you haven't at propagating plants like currants, elderberry, and willow. They're rewarding and they, they give you the confidence you need to get further and deeper into propagating for sure. Um, Permaculture Journey is asking about working with the hardy kiwi. Uh, good side question. The standard hardy kiwi, uh, Actinidia arguda, I, we grow them. They are insanely aggressive where we live and I think potentially could be ecologically maybe disastrous, problematic, somewhere on that continuum. Amazing fruit, very worthwhile, uh, but you, they really need to be on their own trellis, isolated from a healthy forest. Actinidia colcomica, colcomita, the Arctic kiwi. We're starting to grow them now and they seem way more mild mannered. So um, I think hardy kiwis are great. Please be careful where you plant them. Okay, now let me get caught up here a little. John Lennigan, do you have any suggestions or resources for planting permaculture in a rental scenario? practicing permaculture in a rental scenario? That's a really nice question. I'm glad you're interested in planting where you live for now. I, personally, I, th the number of times where I've planted perennials in places that I've lived temporarily is all of them. And I think talk with the landlord, talk with whoever is the long-term person there. Ben, thank you so much. That's really wonderful. Appreciate it. Um, and if you can get permission to put in a peach tree, to put in a patch of oregano and put in some strawberries, a lot of landlords would appreciate that if you take care of them. And it's a nice legacy to leave there. If they are not willing or open to having you plant longer term plants, 
consider exploring container gardening and you can get all sorts of different containers that are mobile. You can fill with wood chips on the bottom and soil on top and grow annuals and maybe even do some propagation. Maybe you're growing some trees from seed in portable beds because you're living at this place this year, but maybe you're going to have land you can plant into next year. And so trees can be annuals for this season for you. Um, but consider it for sure and talk talk with your landlord, get them excited. Maybe they really wanna have that happen. Um, okay, how many elderberries do you recommend for a family of six? We got three, three cuttings will give you thousands of plants soon enough. Just make sure you have at least, if you're growing elderberry, make sure you've got at least two varieties or a variety and a wild plant so that you have some novel uh, pollen so they can pollinate each other. That's very important. Greg, thank you. Five dollars, I appreciate it very, very much. And let me address your question and then I'll go back a little bit. Uh, any thoughts of geothermal greenhouses can achieve a steady 56F? Um, I, I can't speak to geothermal because both of the sites that we have access to work with in the winter, if we dig a foot down, we're hitting water. And so I, I've, the research that I've done, it seems incredibly compelling and it makes sense. If you can go down into the earth and move air through it, you're gonna get warmth in the winter and cool in the summer, but we just simply don't have firsthand experience with it because our sites are too wet. Uh, everything is site uh, specific for sure. Okay. Bear with me, I'm getting caught up again. Jeff is asking, boy, these questions are all over the map and I like this, we might as well, we're, we're going for season extension overall, but folks are clearly interested in plant propagation. Um, I think the next question and answer session will be specific on all things plant propagation because there's a lot of interest there. Uh, any advice on scarifying honey locust and black cherry seeds from Jeff Marchand? Marchand. Um, I will say I do not have any experience with black cherry seeds, so I can't answer that. Um, honey locust, a member of Fabiaceae clan, or are they in their own crew? Anyway, they're of the type of tree that makes rock hard seeds. And so what I've found with honey locust, with black locust, with red bud, um, very hard bean and pea-like seeds from trees is hot scarification does an amazing job of waking them up. And what that is, is basically imagine so you're heating up water to make a nice hot cup of tea and you put your seeds in a mug or in a bowl that can uh, take heat, and you take that hot tea water and pour them over and let that sit for a day or so. So it's basically, you're not bringing them up to a boil, you're not cooking them, you're pouring hot water over those seeds. And the next day, the seeds that have been scarified by that hot water treatment will be noticeably larger. They can be pulled out and planted. The small seeds that are not, that didn't react you can drain the water off and try it again. And that worked very well for us. That's what I do. Um, yeah, Robbie, it actually does. It literally grows on trees. And it's so easy. Once you get into it, you realize there are parts that are hard, but there's just rules of engagement for each of these plants. And it's great to remember that as a fundamental, all of the plants want to be more plants. And so you're working with a system that doesn't, it's not dragging, nobody's dragging their feet saying, I don't want you to make a million babies of me. Um, it's just a matter of helping them or facilitating the way that they need to go about doing that. So you're really dropping into something that wants to happen anyway. It's pretty satisfying. Um, so Eyes of My Heart is asking with fevered question marks, please tell me how you allow airflow in the high tunnel. So really, like I said, it's we have the door that opens, which allows huge amount of airflow. If you're in a much warmer climate or you have concerns about how much airflow you may need, you can build a much larger window. You can be have a window that's as wide as the whole high tunnel, and that would allow for complete air exchange for sure. Um, 
Okay, I see a question. What do you plant in the high tunnel during the summer? So yeah, right now we're getting organized so that in the next week or two, maybe three weeks, we're gonna be starting our very cold loving seeds for plants that will ultimately move out to the garden. So our kales, lettuces, broccolis, um, spinaches, you know, the, the cooler weather crops that we wanna move out. As we move them out, we'll start seeds for warmer loving crops, our solanaceous things like tomatoes and the like. Um, and then as far as what we actively grow in the high tunnels, we try to keep it to plant. Basically, we generally grow tomatoes in there because our cool, um, moist area, we get disease very easily. And a high tunnel is a great place to accumulate lots of sun energy, lots of heat, and to keep the soil the, the amount of humidity you want. So tomatoes do really well for us. We might do some more hot peppers this year, and we might explore more um, interesting, marginally hardy crops. I might want to do some lemongrass and things like that as what we grow in there for this season. Um, advice on a swarm of bees. Now we're going too far off. Other folks can answer that one. Let's try to keep, so we're at 50 minutes. Let's go to about an hour. Um, are there other specific questions for high tunnels, season extension, things along that line? I think I'm gonna seek out those questions for the remainder of this time with the idea that we'll be offering, I, I really see the interest here in plant propagation. So we'll be offering that one next. Um, in fact, that is all the questions I'm getting. <laughs> um, so I'll address the ones that I'm seeing here. Uh, when is the best time to dig Jerusalem artichokes in the Finger Lakes area? Would they be sold as tubers or should I grow them up a little and pot them? Best thing to do is dig them up when the ground can be worked in the spring and to sell them as tubers. You can pot them up, but they are so rapid growing that they'll outstrip any pot you put them in very quickly. So I like to sell them as low cost tubers and give a little demonstration on how easy they are to plant. Um, okay, Robbie. What do you think of using a cattle panel high tunnel as an easy semi-permanent storage structure? Uh, I think if, if you're storing small things, then maybe. I personally think uh, if, I, if I wanted to have a place to store things that is inexpensive, fast, and easy to build, I would go pallet centric. And Robbie, since I know you live right near where I live because we are friends and we work together, um, I would go, there's some pallet depots that I could let you know about, but wherever you live, I would look at pallets as the, the key element because cattle panel, high tunnel, you're buying new panels, you're buying poly, and then you're creating a hot space for storing things. I don't think I would go that route. I'd let it be, uh, simple shed roof, pallet based. You can put sides on them if you need to, but by and large, it serves really nicely for us. And the price is way lower when you go pallet based because the pallets are free. Um, Jaden is asking, can you connect a chicken coop to a high tunnel for winter feeding or do you need more separation? Uh, thank you, Paul, appreciate it. Um, I don't know. I originally thought that I wanted to connect a the winter run directly to their coop. And I'm glad that it didn't work out for us to do that because it's a massive amount of heat and steam and moisture. And I just think it wouldn't be good for the chicken's lungs overall. If we wanted to have our chickens living in a high tunnel during the winter months, I think the high tunnel would have to be much, much larger, much more room for gases to accumulate up high and leave through a soffit or something along that line. Um, but I think the separation is reasonable. I think juxtaposition is key so that in the coldest, snowiest times of year, the chickens have a short a distance to get to their winter run. Uh, but I think that decoupling seems to be critical and I'm glad it didn't work out for me to make that mistake. 
Um, okay, so Jeff is asking, does a high tunnel give enough protection from cold for chickens? Can I do without a coop? I would give that a resounding no. I don't think a cattle panel high tunnel as itself is an appropriate uh, housing solution for chickens. It is completely not predator proof. Any creature can bust through that plastic easily. You could wrap it in chicken wire and all that, but I don't think it's the solution as housing for, for hens. I could be wrong on that, but I, I wouldn't use that as a foundational design direction. Um, Eve King is asking, what are your thoughts on using ground cover in the high tunnel? We don't use plastic as weed suppression in any of our systems. We're not locked against that idea. Maybe in the future we'd explore it, but I've only found it to be problematic over time. And especially in a high tunnel where you've got an, an incredible accumulation of heat and sun energy, you're really asking for plastic to leach out into the soil more. Uh, I think you can get away with deep mulch, um, and it's a small enough space that you can probably keep on top of the weeds with hand tools. At least that's been my experience there. Um, what does the Jerusalem artichoke taste like? They're great. <laughs> um, okay, so we're pretty close. We're near an hour, and I think, are we caught up? If I missed a question that you put forward before that relates to season extension or high tunnels and the like, please feel free to pop it in now. Otherwise, I think we'll be wrapping up pretty soon. Um, and I wanna say to folks, thank you so much for, it's been really exciting developing this channel in a, in a slow and steady iterative way. Um, it would be neat if, in some ways, if the channel took off, but I like the more grounded feeling, actually, of it just kind of slowly building in good direction. So thank you all for being part of that. Uh, and I look forward to offering a lot more content in the spring coming up and, of course, documenting all our experiments in the summer. The next question and answer session to be determined, but I, as far as timing, but it certainly will be about all things related to plant propagation, because that's very clearly the most uh, interest that we have here. Okay. Thank you all for being part of this, and I think that will be that. It feels like a good place to wrap up. Hope you all have a lovely evening, and I'm so excited to know there's so many people out there interested in growing more things where they live. Take care, everybody. <laughs>